Hello, and welcome to today's episode of the For the Joy Missionary Show. I am so thrilled to be with you, as always, and I have such an incredible guest to chat with today that I can't wait to share with you. Her name is Bridget Flood, and she is the author of Blue Hole Wisdom, um, My Journey with the Sisters, and she's going to share with us today about the joy that she experienced in, in being with a community of sisters. So, Bridget, thank you so much for joining me today. Great to see you, Jill. So Bridget, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you ended up spending so much time with the sisters. Well, I uh, started my career actually in, uh, not in philanthropy. I work at their foundation. It's the Incarnate Word Foundation. It's a charitable foundation. And I actually found my job in the newspaper. I had been huh. working in a Catholic health system and actually knew one of their sisters, although I didn't know this job was open. And so about 23 years ago, I ended up going into philanthropy, working with our sisters. Um, in my private life, I'm an artist, I'm a beekeeper, and um, I think I'm interested in spirituality. And so it was a good fit because creativity is an important aspect of being a philanthropist. Mm -hmm. And uh, it also helped me write Blue Hole Wisdom, My Journey with the Sisters. Yeah. So tell us about the book. What is, first of all, what is the name about Blue Hole Wisdom? Well, Blue Hole Wisdom, I have a copy of it right here. Uh, Blue, the Blue Hole is a sacred place in San Antonio, Texas. I work with the Sisters of Charity of the Incarnate Word, and they are a Catholic group of sisters based out of San Antonio. And on their property um, is something called the Blue Hole, and it's a natural spring. It was sacred to the original people who lived in San Antonio, the Native Americans. And when the sisters came to San Antonio in 1869, it was a geyser. It actually huh. shot up in the air. But over time, as San Antonio has been built up, the aquifer has been drained somewhat. So sometimes the blue hole mm. is dry. And when you see it, and anyone can go see it, it's part of a nature conservatory, so it's open to the public. Mm -hmm. It looks almost like a large well, a stone well, and you look down, mm -hmm. and there's this incredible blue water that flows out, and that water is the headwaters of the San Antonio River. Huh. So if you've ever been to the river walk, that water started on our sister's property at the Blue Hole. Wow, that is awesome. So how long have the sisters been established there? The sisters came from France in 1869. Actually, that's the first chapter of my book, talking about their journey. And it's interesting because people always think of sisters who founded congregations as being old women. Because mm -hmm. the pictures of them are usually at the end of their term of office. And so they're older and they're in these long black habits. Well, the picture two women coming from France who were in their early 20s. They had six wow. weeks of preparation. Bishop Dubuis had invited them to come over, and they're on a boat. They come over to, to San Antonio. They journey separately. One of them came before the other. Mother Pierre came second. And there they are in San Antonio, Texas. There was a third woman who joined them from Galveston. There were a few sisters there. They go to San Antonio by stagecoach. They get there. The place they're supposed to stay has burned down. They're in the middle of a cholera epidemic. And the Erskine sisters took them in. And they were there to care for the poor and heal people who were suffering from cholera. Yeah. So think about somebody in their early 20s not speaking the language. The house is burned down. They have practically no money. And there they are. It's pretty amazing. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. And That's they, started they started looking. That's here 150 plus years later. They did, and actually they sponsor the University of the Incarnate Word in San Antonio. They have a large Catholic mm -hmm. health system. They've had thousands of women over the years join their congregation. They've had orphanages. They've taught in schools. They work at the border with the poor. Um, they're amazing. That is so beautiful. So you primarily kind of spent time with them first through the charitable organization that you worked with. Yes, Correct. I came to work with them, and we have about 250 sisters. Half of our sisters are Mexican, so we've okay. had people from Mexico in eight since 1890, so we're multicultural. We're in Peru, mm -hmm. and through my work with them, I've been able to travel 
to Peru to see the sisters there. I've gotten mm -hmm. to go with them to Zambia. They had some sisters in Zambia for a while. Um, I also have gone um, to Ireland, or some of our sisters are from Ireland, mm -hmm. and then obviously to San Antonio. So I've really been walking my own life journey with them this entire 20 years. And what inspired me to write the book was um, all the wisdom and mm -hmm. happiness and joy that they bring to their ministries, mm -hmm. which will be lost because... Yeah. They're, you know, obviously part of the Catholic Church, but they really are called themselves to a very unique interpretation of that. Hmm. Um, so it's it's not just going to mass if you're Catholic. It's mm -hmm. it's part of how they live their life, and their yeah. wisdom is something that I wanted to capture. So that's absolutely that's why I wrote the book. Absolutely. So you have a chapter in the book specifically about joy and and kind of focused on one particular sister's iteration of joy. So I'd love for you to share um, the poem and the story about that sister with us. Yeah, I would love to share that with you. Um, each of the chapters of the book is kind of either a story about some of the travels I've done with them or a story of one of our particular sisters and the new, unique wisdom that they bring. Mm -hmm. And one of our sisters, who was a very close friend of mine, Sister Naomi Hayes, one of our Irish sisters. So picture somebody who's about five foot tall on a good day, uh -huh. tiny eyed, little tiny sprite of a thing. But there's a little tartness uh -huh. behind the sweetness. So it's not all sweet and light. It's there's a there's just a little catch sometimes. That's very. And I sat down. I sat down to talk to Naomi about um, what she wanted to share in the book. And she started by handing me a poem, and it's a poem by Mary Oliver that I'd like to share with everyone. Yeah. Um, and it's called Messenger. My work is loving the world. Here the sunflowers, there the hummingbird, equal seekers of sweetness. Here the quickening yeast, there the blue plums. Here the clam deep in the speckled sand. Are my boots old? Is my coat torn? Am I no longer young and still half perfect? Let me keep my mind on what matters, which is my work, mm. which is mostly standing still and learning to be astonished. The Phoebe, the Delphinium, the sheep in the pasture and the pasture itself, which is mostly rejoicing since all the ingredients are here. With, a, with, with this is gratitude to be given to a, a mind and a heart and to these body clothes, a mouth with which to go shouts of joy to the moth and the wren, to the sleepy dug-in clam, telling them all over and over how it is that we live forever. Mm. And so after Naomi shared that Mary Oliver poem with me, she looked at me and she said, well, Bridget, my work is to bring joy to the world. Huh. And that's exactly what she did her entire life. She worked at our sister's college back in the 50s and 60s, helping girls who were at that time fairly sheltered mm -hmm. because it was a women's college, listening to their troubles, helping counsel them with their boyfriend issues, being there to make a sympathetic cup of tea if they failed an exam. And then mm -hmm. back in 1980, she shifted direction all, all the way around and read some writings by Dorothy Day, hmm. the social justice activist, and decided yeah. to found something called Visitation House, hmm. where she worked with homeless women and children, Hispanic women and children, mm -hmm. and actually lived with them. It was a large, mm -hmm. dilapidated mansion that they repaired, and the women and their children would come, and they formed this joyful community. Wow. And Naomi was just there with them, helping them with their needs, helping them get an education, helping them get their homes, helping them make lives for themselves, but always bringing that joy. Yeah. And then at the end of her life, when she was retired, when I would travel to San Antonio, I would stay with her and another sister named Sister Dot, and she really brought her joy to me. Hmm. So that when I'd arrive, she'd have a pitcher of iced tea, even though she's Irish. So iced tea is just anathema. But yeah, she would make iced tea just for me and the little blue, blue pitcher. Everything was thoughtfully done. Hmm. You know, she'd make breakfast every day. We'd have cut up fruit. It was just this lovely routine. There was no television. 
in their home. Uh, mm -hmm. It was it was a peaceful, quiet oasis of peace and joy. And that was her gift to the world and her gift to me. Yeah. An amazing woman. Amazing woman. That is so beautiful. That is something that um, I've heard so often in relation to this idea of, of women that are called to the sister, um, to the, the, you know, life as a sister. Um, this idea that they have this very particular joy that is something that is so hard for people especially people who are not, um, you know, do not have faith at all or do not have particular faith in Jesus to understand, but it's, it's really something that flows from their vocation or should flow from their vocation. Well, it really does. And, you know, that's one of the misconceptions that I encounter a lot. People assume that the reason so many be people became Catholic sisters back in the 50s and 60s was because there was nothing else for them to do. Yeah. So I don't want to get married. I don't want to be living at home or working in a store or some menial job. So I'm going to become a sister so that I can do something else. And mm -hmm. none of the sisters I talked with for my book ever said that was the reason that they did this. Huh. Not a one. You know, most of them said, well, they each had a unique story. Like one, mm -hmm. one sister, Sister Alice, who's one of our most creative sisters, was walking past a burlesque club in Chicago. And they were calling for people to come in and she's like, this is terrible, those poor women, I wanna help them. And she uh -huh. resisted the idea of becoming a sister, but she's like, well, what else can I do? And so yeah. she became a sister. Another sister found her vocation going on the train to San Antonio to see someone else who was becoming a sister. And she was in college. Her parents were sending her to college. And she said, you know, I just decided that was what I wanted to do with my life. I wanted to spend my life helping others and caring for others and mm -hmm. exploring the spiritual dimension of myself. Yeah. Wow. That is really beautiful. And it sounds like there's 250 sisters in community now, or is that um, a historical number? No, it's about 225, 250 right now. Okay. I mean, historically, they, they started with three, and within mm -hmm. about, I don't know, the first year, Sister Agnes went back to Galveston. She okay. left. She didn't stay in San Antonio. She had a blood sister who was living in, who was a sister in the congregation in Galveston. Mm -hmm. So it was two. So we really started with two. Mm -hmm. By 1890, they had people in Mexico, women in Mexico, who wanted to be sisters. So then they went to Mexico. They went to Peru about 50 years ago, and they went to Zambia for the um, celebration of the, 2000, the year 2000. Mm, yeah, they were in Zambia for about 15 years. So yeah. are current um, people joining the, um, I would say like, are there a lot of vocations currently um, finding, people finding their vocation with the Sisters of the Incarnate Word currently? Um, yes, we do have vocations. Our novitiate house is here in St. Louis. We have a novice here now. I think there are one or two more who are coming in August. Okay. Um, we had a young woman recently make her temporary vow. So we do, there mm -hmm. are still sisters mm -hmm. um, and they're still getting vocations. Um, that's always a question because there used to be mm -hmm. so many, but yeah. in religious life, there weren't always hundreds and hundreds of sisters. Mm -hmm. We had we had a lot of sisters from like 1930 on till about 1965, okay. and then there was a drop mm -hmm. off. So mm -hmm. in our lifetime, most people are used to the idea. There used to be lots of them, and now there aren't very many. Uh -huh. And I think because most sisters don't wear habits, and uh -huh. people can't say, "Oh, there they are," you know, in this right. long, very hot, heavy wool. Yeah. Um, uh -huh. So that's been a change, but. Um, one of the things several of our sisters stressed to me is that this really is the time, and I think this fits in with your whole theme, Jill, of, of, of joy and being mm -hmm. called. Lay women, lay people are being called. Mm -hmm. They have opened, one of our younger sisters, Sister Miriam, one of our newer sisters, has said this, open wide your tents. Yeah. Our sisters have opened the tent, and lay people like myself, Mm -hmm. who wouldn't have worked for them back in 1940. Right. They're all sisters here. Now there are lay people who are partnering uh -huh. with them, who are collaborating, because the joy that they bring to their work is a joy everyone can share in. Mm -hmm. It isn't, you don't have to be a sister to have the joy of the spirit within you. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that's such an important conversation because I I hear so often the phrase nowadays that the future is lay, like being like lay people are going to be the people that are really taking the active role of leadership in the church. Obviously, a you know, side by side with those who are called to holy orders, but how much empowerment there is going on in the people of God. And we are able to see what is possible so much through the example of women and men that have given their lives in such an extraordinary way um, to the pursuit of Christ and to the pursuit of caring for others in such a radical and all encompassing way. No, that's very true. And and our sister's spirituality is really in the idea of the incarnation. So to, to mm -hmm. our sisters, God is present in the world around us. God is present mm -hmm. in this relationship, this conversation you and I are having, in mm -hmm. the joy that we bring to relationships with our family, our friends, people that we work with, people we are helping, people who, are, who, are, who need to be reached out to. We're bringing that joy and God to yeah. them and christ obviously was the incarnation of god mm -hmm. but the incarnation belongs to everyone that's yeah. the first thing our sisters would say is it isn't that they have the mission and they're giving it to you we mm -hmm. all have the mission we all have the joy of that spirit within us it's mm -hmm. just a question of bringing it out and sharing it with the world yeah that is so beautiful so do your sisters primarily live in community with each other now or are they like excuse me like sister naomi where they kind of live with their individual mission kind of in their individual mission fields most of our sisters live in small groups okay so the days of them living you know several hundred people in one giant sprawling building is really in the past our mm -hmm. sisters live in smaller communities but they typically are with someone else. Okay. I mean, there are instances where a sister might have a ministry that's far from everyone else, and so she's mm -hmm. by herself, but typically they're in these groups. So they live in community. And um, the community life, I mean, they, they in the morning, they get up, they pray, they, you know, they have a routine mm -hmm. um, that they're very faithful to. So it's a wonderful experience to be able to stay with the sisters yeah to be a part of that whole spiritual context when i mm -hmm. go to san antonio and i'm with our sisters on their main campus by the blue hole i can't tell you what a wonderful feeling it is to just be surrounded by this love by this joy by this mm -hmm. care it it's just like being wrapped in a wonderfully soft blanket yeah love. it's wonderful yeah and I love what you said about their routine and how, um, you know, it's very dependable and very based in their spirituality, because I think what we, um, I, I will never forget looking at the schedule that Mother Teresa created for her sisters in Calcutta, because you would think, okay, they're, you know, serving in the slums of Calcutta. This must just be like all serve all the time, you know try and get as many people through the door situation. And that's not what they did at all. It was very, um, almost half and half of this contemplative time and prayer and the sacraments and things like that. And then also their time serving and being with the poor because they understand how much that they have got to be filled and they've got to be grounded to be able to do the work that they do. And I think that that is one of the most powerful examples that we can take as lay people for how we structure our lives because I think we also get into the like, you know, I'll work all the time. How much can we fit in and and don't have those rhythms of renewal like are built into the life um, that a lot of people in holy orders live. Yeah, I mean, prayer is a big part of their life. I remember when I was in Mexico in Guadalajara and our sisters have a large high school there and we stayed at the convent. And in the morning, I woke up, I'm going to say it was about 6.30, 7 in the morning, and there they were in their small chapel, and they were all praying the office together. Mm -hmm. There were about, I'm going to say, a half a dozen sisters there praying. And it, there was something so beautiful about that, you know, that yeah. they, they start their day with prayer at our office here. We start every meeting with a prayer. Mm -hmm. It's just mm -hmm. a given that this is part of who we are. It isn't an add-on. It's part yeah. of who we are. and. The other thing that I think is very um, important about them is that they are so present to you when they are with you. Yes. That's part of this whole spirituality so that when mm -hmm. you go see them, like when I'll stop in in San Antonio 
every sister, no matter how busy they are, come around the desk and say, sit down. And they sit with you. They're not multitasking. They're not texting. They don't have the phone on. I mean, it's it's really a ministry of presence. And yeah. in our world today, how often are we truly present to other people? I yeah. mean, I think about myself on Zoom calls with meetings, and I'm knitting while people are talking, and, you know, the uh -huh. dog comes in, I'm fooling with the dog, then the dog Zoom bombs. I mean, <laughs> we're all busy. The people are yeah. texting on their phone to me while we're in the meeting. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's crazy. Yeah. And it, it's, it's not only is it a bit rude, but the other piece of it is, is it, it really minimizes the other person's humanity because what you're saying is I'm too distracted. I have too many things to really focus on you. And there's mm -hmm. such joy in that relationship. I, I mean, mm -hmm. I think of all the times they've come around the desk and sat next to me in a little sitting area and said, I'm here for you. Take what you need. Take all the time you need. Wow. That is such a yeah. beautiful gift. That is. And that is so radical. Like you're saying in our world today, um, because in the past you think about it, you know, there was, there was multitasking, there was you know, doing the wash and picking the vegetables and things like that while you're talking to people. But to a certain extent prior, especially prior to the written word, um, being, you know, quickly available, obviously, um, you know, before the printing press, what else were people going to do? They were going to be present to each other. And, and in all of our quote unquote advancements, what are we what have we also lost in in terms of our ability to not get distracted and to be with people because i think that that's one of the things you really see especially in the modern saints is how much people experience them being able to just be present with them like you're talking about with the sisters that's something that people share so much about john paul ii when you are, you know, when you were in audience with him, when you're in front of him, our emeritus bishop here in Tulsa was actually ordained by John Paul II and had a brief audience with him at that time. And it was just like, you feel like you're the only human being in the world when he's talking to you. And how much that is an extension of the incarnation, which I had never put together before, but that's so beautiful about how the sisters weave that together. Well, it really is true. The whole idea of pre being present, and that, that is such a gift to people, mm -hmm. just to be present to someone else. I had the opportunity to meet Pope Francis several mm. years ago, and he's shaking hands, and he takes my hand, and normally I can talk a mile a minute. I was speechless, and yeah. he looked me straight in the eye as I'm holding his hand, and he said, you pray for me, I'll pray for you. Huh. But he looked right at me, and then he went and looked at the next person. And what mm -hmm. really impressed me is that the people he spent the most time with, because I was with some Catholic Foundation people, so people who could give funds, uh -huh. he spent very little time with that group. He only talked to the first few people. Then he turned, and there was a, a group of people who were with children who were in wheelchairs. Mm -hmm. And he talked not just to each adult, but each child. And he did everyone in this entire large group. I stood there and watched him and I thought, wow. 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 Because mm -hmm. he's bringing joy to the people who are suffering, who are feeling mm -hmm. the most pain, who can do nothing for him. Mm -hmm. They're not going to write him a big check. Right. But that was where his emphasis was because that's where yeah. Christ needed to be. And mm -hmm. Christ was in that relationship. Yeah, that is so beautiful. I love that so much. So if people want to um, learn more about the sisters and support the sisters, what is a great way for them to do that? Um, the best way to do that would be to go to our sister's website, which is www.amormeus, which means my love in huh. Latin that was on their scapulars on their old habit. And that's A-M-O-R m-e-u-s dot org if you're exploring a vocation there's mm. information about vocation ministry there um, there's also information about our sister's work in the united states mexico and peru um, and uh, there's all sorts of information yeah awesome so we'll link that in the show notes of this we'll also link to your book blue hole wisdom um my journey with the sisters and um so people can pin, pick that up as well i am so excited to read it great great and i would just leave people with this one thought and that is our sisters came to a 
in response to a call from Bishop Dubuis where he said, Our Lord Jesus Christ, suffering the multitude of the sick and infirm and of every kind seeks relief at your hands. And those hands are the hands of everyone who is watching this podcast. Hmm. It is our hands. It's not just the hands of our sisters. It is the hands of each and every one of us. All of us are called to bring that joy to the world, to others. Absolutely. I love that so much. Thank you so much for your time, Bridget. It's been such a joy to talk to you. Thank you.